Anyway, I, I like that song. It's the first time I ever sang a song, because I was always chicken to sing in church. I thought, i got to get over this, and that was a song I sang. Yep, there's different versions of it, but... Uh, the title of this sermon is Let's Go Fishing. I've been wanting to go fishing here lately. And as soon as you get a balmy Saturday, I was talking to my son who said on the phone, I said, as soon as we get a balmy Saturday, let's me and you go 10 car of fly fishing. Maybe down at Belfont, somewhere like that. Ten Kara is a Japanese type of fly fish and uses a long telescoping fly rod that doesn't have a reel and doesn't have any guides. The, 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 the line comes right off the end of the rod and it's about the length of the rod itself and then there's a tippet and you just put it out there. And they, it started in Japan. So I have two of those. And my son, I called him up one day and I said, this is all your fault. He was getting, he got real quiet. I said, this is all your fault. You did this to me. And I said, you got me all stirred up about this 10 car fishing. And I've been watching YouTube videos. And now I got to order a rod and I'm going to do it. He's so good. He thought I was going to complain about something. It's all your fault. I'm going to go 10 car fishing. Mark chapter 1, 16 to 18. And as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. Casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. In the King James, I will make you fishers of men. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, this morning, as we look into these morsels of your word, we pray that the blessings of your spirit will follow the word into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. How many here like to go fishing? I could just point him out, I think. I know these two right here like to go. He's, he's going like that. Huh? You always fall in? I've done that two or three times. Yeah. The little kid sat on the side of the road um, with a fishing line down the storm drain. Feeling sorry for him and wanting to humor him, a lady gave him 50 cents. And then she asked, how many have you caught? And he said, you're the 10th one this morning. But usually you think about fishing in the spring. I like to start tying flies in January. I didn't start yet, though, this year. I'm getting lazier as time goes by. I'm getting really good at being a procrastinator. When I sit there, there making flies, I anticipate where I'm going to go and how I'm going to use that fly. Two guys are talking about fishing. One says to the other, I'm never going to take my wife fishing with me ever again. The other guy said, that bad, huh? He says, she did everything wrong. She talked too much, made the boat rock constantly, tried to stand up in the boat, baited the hook wrong, used the wrong lures, and worst of all, she caught more fish than me. I'm not taking her fishing with me again. Sometimes things in life seem so bleak that we need a distraction. There are things we all face that are, that are huge against, especially when you get older. And you just need a distraction sometimes to lift you out of that, you know, that bleak, uh, sometimes it's a gloomy thing. So we have hobbies. Lori has horses. That's kind of a hobby. Not anymore. You got rid of the horses. So now you're free from that. But we have hobbies, we have activities we like to do. Games. Younger people play sports. I've never, ever, ever played a sport of one. Yeah, I did. I was in a baseball game one time when I was in Cub Scouts. And I didn't even know where the ball was coming from. The guy was crouched down behind me and had his hand on the bat. And the ball was coming. He says, now, he said, swing. And I swung. He was swinging with me, and I could feel the sting of the ball hitting the bat. He said, now run. So I ran off the field, hopped on my bike, and rode home. That was my one time playing a game. I'm not an athlete. Don't enjoy that kind of stuff. 
when I was a kid, I was always climbing a tree or chasing butterflies or stuff like that. It wasn't so much of a sport kind of thing. My dad's passion in life was playing chess. The game of chess was his escape from the stresses of business and of life. We all have stresses. We look at other people and wonder why certain things cause them to be stressed. But if you look at your own self, there are, all, there are always things causing us to be stressed. Things are maybe not you're going through, but your children are going through. That makes you stressed. If they're stressed, you share that. If the people in, as a pastor, the people in the church are stressed or in physical harm, you know, I share that. I feel that. And that's why I pray for, I know where it hurts. I'm every one of you, I know where it hurts. I do. And I pray for you twice a day. Everyone. Even some that aren't here anymore, I'm still praying for them. But we have things, you know, that get us down. I can remember having a real bad day sometimes when we were in business. But it would be, it would be a bleak existence if we didn't have diversions to carry our spirit or our heart or our mind away from those hard things. I spend a lot of time tying flies. And once in a while, I even go fishing. Not as much as I'd like to. I don't keep the fish. It's just a diversion. It's an escape. It's a getaway from the burdens of daily life. Do you, can you guys identify with that? Can you identify with that? After the resurrection, the disciples of Jesus must have been in a lot of stress. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what's ha going to happen next. They were lost without him. He was their leader. He had called them, and they had followed him. But now he's gone. The temple rulers probably were hostile to them, or at least they felt like that. One of their former members, Judas, is now dead. For three years they had traveled around with Jesus in Judea and Samaria. They had seen everything that he did. They saw him arrested, and they knew that he was resurrected from the dead after the crucifixion. They knew that he was the Messiah. They knew that. They had their faith wrapped up in Jesus, their Lord. But now he's gone, physically gone. The stress must have been enormous. What now? What's going to happen next? Peter seems to be their leader at this time. So we pick up the story in John 21, chapter verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So in the stress of it, Peter said, I'm going fishing. That's my diversion. That, I know how to do that. I know the water. I know the boat. I know the nets. That was my business. I'm going fishing. And the rest of them said, yeah, we'll go too. So they're all going fishing. They got in the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So Peter declares, I'm going fishing. I've had enough of this stress. And six others went along. They agreed. Some of them had been fishermen. Fishing was something to turn to. It was a comfort zone. They didn't know how to minister at this point, but they knew how to fish. So that was their comfort zone. But they also had to make a living. When they were traveling with Jesus, there must have been income because Judas was the treasurer, keeper of the bag, it says in King James. So after fishing all night, they come up with nothing. I'm sure they had experienced unsuccessful fishing trips before. Sometimes you catch them, 
Sometimes you don't. I've been skunked many times. If I go to Fisherman's Paradise, I never catch anything down there. Why do we keep coming back? Because you can see those nice brown trout swimming around in there. You try. Every once in a while, I mean like every, maybe once every 10 years, I might catch a fish down there. But I go down there, I might go down there with my son. But without their leader, with no catch, things were very bleak. Plenty of stress, no Jesus, no fish. Their whole night's effort had yielded nothing. Then Jesus came on the scene. Jesus shows up in the bleakest of times. Amen? He shows up when everything's going crazy, when everything's wrong, when there's nowhere else to turn. Jesus shows up. He's always there. He's always been there, but he manifests himself in the hardest times. He's never very far from us. He's always concerned about what we're going through. We're assured of that. Sometimes we just lose track of it and don't think about it, but he was concerned about their stress. He knew that they would be happy to see him. That being with him would be a great relief to them because fishing wasn't much of a relief unless you just like a boat ride. But he was also concerned about their sustenance. John 21, five and six, he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Of course, he already knew they didn't have any. No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Notice he called them friends. He called out to them, friends. And we can be sure that he calls us friends, that we are the friends of God. We can be sure of that. Even in our bleakest times. He was standing on the shore, but they didn't recognize him. Maybe there was a mist or a fog, or maybe it was dim early before dawn. Maybe it was dark. But... Even though they had fished all night with no results, they took the suggestion. They caught a large amount of fish. They knew that the stranger was the Lord. Then they knew when they couldn't hardly haul the fish aboard. There were so many of them. They were stressed because they were without their leader, the Messiah, the Lord, their Lord. His death was ugly demoralizing gloomy then the glorious resurrection but now they're without without him without his leadership so they decided to take matter into their own hands and Peter says let's go fishing he didn't say let's go do ministry let's go share the gospel he didn't know how to do that yet the Holy Spirit hadn't fallen yet says, let's go fishing Adding to the stress, they didn't catch anything all night. Nothing was working for them. And then Jesus said, verse 10 to 14, bring some of the fish you have just caught. They're still in the boat. He's still on the shore. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Did you ever catch 153 big ones, John? 153? Really? You keep them all? Huh? Oh, crappies, yeah. These things were probably as big as your leg. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them in verse 12, Come and have breakfast. I think it's come and dine in the King James. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? <laughs> Stranger, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And it was also the third time with bread and fish. Two times we're on a mountain when he fed multitudes, and now it's just for them. So Jesus, knowing what they're going through, came on to the scene. 
He probed at what they were doing with a question. He already knew the answer. They had to admit that doing things their own way had no results, no fish. His guidance yielded a fabulous catch. It is also significant uh, that Jesus had prepared the fish and the bread, but he asked for fish from them. He prepared fish and bread, but he asked it, bring some of the fish that you have caught. When the stresses of life seem enormous, when everything seems to be going wrong, when you're having a real bad day, or the doctor is not positive about your test, it seems only natural to want to escape, to go fishing, or whatever your diversion is. Often we fail to include the Lord, to go to Him in our desperation. Sometimes we fail to do that. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Desperation is the opposite of hope. God wants us to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's okay to go fishing, gardening, to resort to an activity that you enjoy, but don't ignore that God cares, that He is there, and that He will provide. You have to be careful not to ignore that fact. Secondly, Jesus provided fish and bread, but asked for a contribution from them, some of the fish they had just caught. Jesus has an inexhaustible supply. He wanted to use what he had directed them, what he had enabled them to catch, bring some of the fish you have just caught. He didn't need their fish but he enabled them to catch them. So now he's going to use what he had enabled them to catch. And that comes down to us today. He had ministered for three years with them in tow. His work was done, John 19 and 30, when he had received the drink. Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. His work what he came to do was finished. But the work continues. Just as he provided a meal, he provided ministry for three years. Bring some of what you caught. He had said in Matthew chapter 4, 19 and 20, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. The disciples would soon take over the ministry. They would be the ministry. It was with his empowerment that they were able to catch 153 large fish. It was a foreshadowing of what was, of what was to come. Is Jesus trying to show them something? Thomas, who had, been, who had doubted, he was in that boat. He was there. He was on that shore. He had some of that bread and fish. None of these disciples knew what to do. They were not prepared to take over the ministry. They hadn't studied hermeneutics. They hadn't studied homiletics. They had no catch to add to the meal until Jesus enabled them. He empowered them until he provided them. Number three, the session on the beach and in the boat points to what the disciples would accomplish with his empowerment. They would add to his catch. They were his catch, along with other people who believed in him. Now they would do the ministry. They would catch a whole lot of big ones, <laughs> like all of us. <laughs> They would catch some big ones. When they were on the boat, success came through his empowerment. The disciples would get an empowerment now for ministry. Acts chapter 2, verse 4 verses, you know this very well. 
When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were, where they were sitting. The sound came from heaven. It doesn't say there was a wind. It was that rushing sound. The sound came from heaven. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that was just an outward sign of what happened internally to them. They, they acquired a boldness. They would now be able to do the ministry. Jesus is the baptizer. The Holy Spirit is the power. He is the enablement. And Peter went out in the street and preached a sermon. He had never done that before. He's a fisherman. He was a cowardly person. And he, 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 did, he was a, a coarse person, just a very blue-collar kind of guy. He had never, never preached a sermon. He didn't actually know. He wasn't prepared to do that. But the whole sermon is recorded in the book of Acts. He used scriptures. And 3,000 people got saved that day and the church was born. They were cut to the heart. They said, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. A large catch was added <laughs> to what Jesus did. His catch was the disciples. A large catch now. 3,000 people. The church was born. It is the will of God that believers do the fishing, do the ministry, and make a catch. That's God's will for all of us. Number five, can it be that God allows us to go through stressful seasons to drive us into his hands? Think about that. He allows us to go through hard things. So we'll come to him. Can it be that God wants to use our stressful situations to turn us toward himself? Can it be that God wants us to fish for men? Most definitely, most definitely. Can it be that God has a catch on the right side of our boat <laughs> waiting for you to draw in the net? Can it be? Are you a soul winner? Matthew chapter 9, 36 to 37. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers, workers are few. What about you? Been fishing? <laughs> Have you been fishing? Have you thrown out a net or thrown out a line to somebody? I think this church in the last year, I think there were five salvations here. Praise God. I think the, the year before there might have been nine. There might have been nine. I should put a sticker in my Bible. You know, I thought the old west had put a notch in their gun if they shot somebody. Put a sticker in my Bible each time because I kind of forget. But do you go through some hard things? Do you go through some times we just wonder what's going to happen next? The older we get, the harder things get, it seems like. You wonder, we, we see what, what's in the news. And I don't dwell on that stuff. I watch it in the morning. I watch Fox News in the morning. I get a dose of it so I know what's going on. And then I don't watch that evening all those people, maybe I'll watch one of them for a little while, but it's the same stuff over and over again all day long. And it can get you down. Dwelling on that stuff. Dwell on the goodness of God. Amen. And try to see if there's a person in your in your life that you come across that maybe you need to share the gospel with. Maybe you need to be a soul winner for somebody. Amen. The stresses will happen. We're still living under the curse. Life was perfect for Adam and Eve. But I don't know. I, you know, I've been on the planet for 75 years. And I've never seen anything quite like what's going on in the world today or in this country. Never seen anything quite like it, where evil 
is called good and celebrated. And what is good is denounced. Everything's upside down. That's enough to cause any believer to be stressed. When the church is shrinking, the people don't come back. That causes a pastor to be stressed. I rise above it. I try to get over it. And then somebody new comes. I think, hey, there's somebody new. <clears throat> and that's cool. Sometimes I go make flies. <laughs> but every morning, I dig into the scripture. Every morning and every evening, I have a time of prayer. That's where we need to go. Amen. Would you stand? It's 1134. Now there's plenty of time for you to be careful on the way home. I don't know what's, what it's like out there right now, but there's plenty of time. It was sort of a short sermon, but uh, I'd just like to take a moment and pray with you all. Lord, we thank you for this house of believers in this place, Lord. We thank you that we know you placed us here in this church at this time for a reason. We know it's your will that, that men should not perish, but that it, they should have everlasting life. And we know we have a part in that. We know we have a net. And we know that we should cast it and bring believers in. And we pray that you would impress each of us in our own way to share the gospel, Lord, and to bring in some big ones. And we pray, Lord, that your hand will be with us in all the ministry that we attempt to do. We pray this this year, Lord, for this church to grow, to have growth in this in this year. Lord. We pray again for Mary and for Casey, and Lord, for people that are traveling today. We pray for each of one of the believers in the house today that has to run away home. That if there are still hazards out there, that uh, we be very cautious and that you would deliver us, Lord. And be with us till we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my friends.